Harrington Aidney Campbell, and this is the History of Musical Theatre podcast. West Side Story would not exist without Jerome Robbins. He was the choreographer and is credited with the concept. But before that, Mr. Robbins had a successful career as a dancer and a choreographer for both ballet and Broadway. As a quick note, on this episode, I'm going to be touching ever so briefly on a couple of other dance practitioners who were really influential around this time um, and who had an impact on Jerome Robbins and the climate he was working in. Most of the references for these other dancers and choreographers come from three books. Agnes DeMille's Portrait Gallery, Laura Jacobs' Celestial Bodies, How to Look at Ballet, and Elizabeth Courier and Philippe Nuzet's Talk About Contemporary Dance. I've also pulled quite a bit from Robert Emmett Long's Broadway, The Golden Years, Jerome Robbins, and the great choreographer directors, 1940 to the present, for stories about Jerome Robbins and some additional information about all of the other people. If you want to keep reading about ballet or contemporary dance or musical theatre, I definitely recommend these books. Jerry was born Jerome Rabinowitz, which I think is a pretty cool name, and also a very clearly Jewish name. This is important, as his family were part of a Jewish subculture that was really into culture. He had an older sister, and they were both quite artistically gifted. His sister Sonia danced, and Jerome studied the piano, violin, and visual arts. The elder Rabinowitz had some early success as a dancer, including touring with a Duncan dancer, a trainee and adopted daughter of contemporary dance pioneer Isadora Duncan. Isadora Duncan is known for her improvised dance performances, stripping back dance to its most basic elements, and for her, uh, bohemian life. She is also importantly known as the woman who elevated dance to an art form. I'm sure other people helped, but I can't cover everyone. The episode would be a thousand hours long. If you were to attend an Isadora Duncan concert, You would see her draped as she imagined a Greek goddess would be, a piano, and a pianist. The performance would be entirely improvised and made up of simple steps. These basic movements consisted of walking, running, skipping, jumping, and standing. George Copeland, a pianist who worked with her on one such concert, asked to rehearse with her to see how she worked. When he asked for details on how he should play the music given to him, Duncan responded, Play as though I were not here. Play as you would for yourself. Out of your own heart, forget me. It's not surprising, given all of this, that her style is often referred to as free dance. What about her bohemian lifestyle? Well, she was reported to have wanted one child with each of the six greatest, in her mind, men on earth. What did she want to do with these children? Well, likely abandon them to her sister, as she did with her other children. She did that whenever she wanted to go somewhere or do something where a child would be an inconvenience, which happened a lot. And her adopted daughters, the kind Sonia Robinowitz trained with? Isadora Duncan adopted young women who she wanted to train as dancers. Their treatment wasn't much better. The group of them were once left in New York with nothing until George Copeland organized for them to give some concerts. If I sound a bit judgy, it's because I am. I can fully appreciate the fact that Isadora elevated dance and the role of women in the arts and think her child-rearing skills are abysmal. An alternate name for this episode could really be You Can Think Two Things About a Person. You'll see. I think Isadora Duncan can be beautifully summed up in two quotes from choreographer Agnes DeMille, that she was known to speak an impartial mix of wisdom and poppycock, and that it became fashionable to boast of having had a week with Isadora, whether true or false, the chance of contradiction being slight. Back to the Rabinowitzes. Jerome spent his summers as a teenager at Camp Kittatinny, which is a mouthful, where each year they staged a show. A book I read in my research called it a musical, and then listed a bunch of Gilbert and Sullivans. I talked about genre differences last season, It's episode two, if you want to know. I'd call those operators. But the point is that Robbins Rabinowitz performed in them. He did mostly comedic roles, 
Major General Stanley and Pirates of Penzance, I am the very model of a modern Major General. The Lord High Executioner in the Mikado, Sir Joseph Porter in HMS Pinafore. After graduating high school, he started at NYU, which he didn't enjoy, so in 1936, the next year, he left. The Jerome Robbins Foundation listed in their timeline of his life that he didn't find the coursework congenial. So instead, he started working a normal person job and dancing unpaid at the Chuck Sander Dance Center Company. While he was there, he trained with Stanford Meisner, who created an acting technique based on repetition. He also studied dance, including with Martha Graham. Martha Graham is one of the most influential contemporary dancers and choreographers of ever. She is a major player in the American movement that created contemporary dance, as we understand it. Her connections extend like a spider web out into the future of not only contemporary dance, but also musical theatre dance. Talk about contemporary dance describes her like this. Out of her own body, Graham pulled a dance vocabulary that was womb-weighted and spring-fertile. A new tradition. All pattern, pure ritual, entirely female. She was the movement's high priestess, with her own distinctive style. The Graham technique involved contraction and release designed to free the body's energy. Graham's contribution, though still based on narratives that recounted Greek tragedies or American myths, was considerable. Though her teaching in particular would influence an entire new movement of local choreographers. That quote is pulled from a few places in the book, but I made sure to keep the integrity of it. Who was this new movement she influenced? Most important to contemporary dance would probably be Merce Cunningham, who was a member of her company and then went on to work extensively as a choreographer and create his own contemporary technique. Along with Graham technique, you can study Cunningham technique. She was also a mentor to Agnes DeMille, trained Pearl Lang, who would wow audiences in Rodgers and Hammerstein's Carousel. Alvin Ailey took classes with her and went on to found the Alvin Ailey Company. Even Madonna has studied Graham technique. Martha herself was inspired by Ruth St. Dennis and began her training at the Denishawn School before setting out on her own. Throughout her life, she gave small concerts in New York to audiences of fanatics and then funded that by going on vaudeville tours. The world of dance was truly in a strange time of flux. And in the middle of that flux was Jerome Rabinowitz. The next year, he joined Camp Kitanani. Kitatini. It's still hard to say. To teach dance and manage the Gilbert and Sullivan productions. And a job at Camp Tenement, where they had a series of shows and cabarets. It served as a pretty key training ground for Jerome. Camp Tenement is described in Broadway The Golden Years as a socialist-owned adult camp with a clientele that tended to be Jewish and politically left, and that it offered original entertainment by young performers that was distinctly superior summer theatre fare. It was not uncommon for New York theatre professionals to attend the Saturday night reviews. It was here that Robbins first tried out stage names. Robin Gerald, Jerry Robbins, with one B and a Y, and finally, Jerome Robbins, two Bs and an I. He worked extensively while he was there with Anita Alvarez, another former Martha Graham company member, and they were known around camp for their speciality numbers. Latin Quarter, a rumba, and At the Anchor, a hornpipe. Just gotta say, foreshadow, 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 foreshadow. It's just a tiny fraction of the work Jerry did at Tenement. The job paid $200 a week and offered board and gave pretty great training and opportunities for performers. It was such an attractive prospect he went each year from 1938 to 1941. The aforementioned Chuck Sander recommends that Robbins begin ballet and he starts taking classes with a former Anna Pavlova company member. The book Celestial Bodies describes her like this. Anna Pavlova, probably the most influential ballerina in history, toured the world in a short solo of shimmering pathos called The Dying Swan, choreographed for her in 1905 by Mikhail Gokin. 
it was a transubstation of arabesques and bourrées that put the swan on an invisible cross and made of ballet for three trembling, tremulous minutes a sacrament, body and blood and a passion. So like no big deal or anything. Her arabesques were particularly famed. The book actually has a whole chapter on arabesques called Arabesques Above All, more generally. It gives descriptions of Anna Pavlova's arabesques from Genady Smekov, which sounds like a fake name, and Agnes de Mille, ethereal and sculpturesque from the former. And balanced on the poised arc of the foot, the other leg stretched to the horizon like the wing of a bird from the latter. She toured the US in 1910, 1915, and 1916. Broadway The Golden Years describes her impact as someone who drew young people to careers in dance at a time when there were few opportunities for employment. These young people included the likes of Agnes de Mille and Alyssa Markova. Interestingly, Anna Pavlova was not an extremely technically proficient dancer. She was one of the dancers who opted out of the famous 32 Fuetes at the end of Swan Lake. It was her performance that drew people to her. Alongside ballet, with Ella Daglanova, Jerome studied interpretive dance, Spanish dance, oriental dance, and choreography. Just a quick note, the, the book says oriental dance, not my term. It credits these lessons to Yechi Nomura, who was an established Japanese concert dancer. Given this training in a mix of styles, including a lot of national folk styles, it's not surprising that Maria Fay, in her book My Approach to Character Dance, credits Robbins as someone who helped carry character dance into the modern era, as well as into musical theatre. West Side Story will be a particularly strong example of this. The same year he started ballet training, he got a professional job. Yay! Dancing in the Brothers Ashkenazi for $10 to $15 a week. Less yay! (laughs) His ballet training, however, was put to good use when he auditioned for The Great Lady, which was being choreographed by George Balanchine. I'm going to give us a few more minutes of Robbins before I dive into... Balanchine take that whole divergence, but I promise, he is coming back. 1939 saw Robbins in two Broadway shows, Stars in Your Eyes and The Straw Hat Review. The next year, he performed in Keep Off the Grass, another George Balanchine show. He also joined the Ballet Theatre, which is now the American Ballet Theatre, or ABT. If you remember last season, you'll know that this is a company that Agnes DeMille worked with. Agnes Namil was a ballet and Broadway co- I'm I'm kidding. That I'm not doing that again. Season one has an episode with biographies of both Agnes DeMille and director Ruben Mamoulian. Plus, I've quoted her like 406 times in this episode. I do have to say though, if you're looking for a book to read while recovering from an injury, niche, I know, her memoir Reprieve is amazing. The Ballet Theatre performed a program on Broadway from February to March of 1941, which included excerpts from Giselle, Anthony Tudor's gala performance, and Agnes de Mille's comic ballet, Three Virgins and a Devil, in which Jerome played the youth. In the same year, he became a soloist, the next rank up in a ballet company. His summer was spent in part at Camp Tenement, and in part as a student at Jacob's Pillow. Jacob's Pillow was, and is in large part, still a training centre for dancers. There he would work again with Anthony Tudor. In Portrait Gallery, Agnes de Mille says the following. It is no ordinary experience to discover one evening that an intimate, a known, well-loved daily companion has genius that stands outside of the standards we set for ourselves. The person speaks with the usual voice, laughs with the ordinary expression, and then, without transition or warning, becomes a figure of magic. This is a feeling she applied to only three people. Sybil Shearer, Carmelita Marici, and Anthony Tudor. 
There wasn't a ton of information on Anthony Tudor in the books I was using for research on this episode, because he wasn't super involved either in contemporary dance or in musical theatre dance. His work was predominantly in classical ballet. Because of this, I'm also going to be pulling from the Anthony Tudor Ballet Trust website. He began his career in London, working for Marie Rambert as a secretary, janitor, all the things, and training under her. Agnes de Mille actually also studied with Marie Rambert for a time, and created her ballet, Three Virgins and a Devil, which Robbins would later appear in, on Anthony Tudor. His first major choreographic success was Jardin au Lélas. Or Lilac Garden. I'm just trying to flex my mediocre French on you. The basic story was a woman saying goodbye to her love before her arranged marriage to someone else. Something new about this ballet was its Edwardian period dress. Quoting from the Tudor Trust. Ironically, this ballet almost didn't make the stage, as Rambert was not exactly thrilled with this departure from tradition. In a famously told story, Tudor and others convinced Rambert this ballet had to be performed at least once to not harm Tudor's future career, and after that ballet she could announce it would not be performed again. Sixteen curtain calls later, Rambert never made the announcement. Tudor wanted to make ballet accessible for everyone, the general public, and his choreography had some pretty huge variety in it, ranging from the sombre lilac garden to comedic ballets like Gala Performance, which featured three ballerinas from three different countries all trying to upstage each other. This ballet also featured Nora Kay, a dancer who Robbins would work with quite extensively. Speaking of Robbins, the next year he was promoted again, this time to principal, which is the highest rank within an American ballet company. Despite becoming a principal after only three or four years of ballet training, he was finding himself dissatisfied, mostly because he spent too much time dressed as a peasant. In spite of him being a member of the Russian diaspora, he found it all too Russian. This dissatisfaction grew worse when he saw his first Balanchine ballet, Apollo, in 1943. Creative mind that he was, Robbins decided to pitch some ideas to the ballet theatre for works that he could choreograph. There's a term that I coined a few years ago to talk about myself. Extravaganza syndrome. It's where you only come up with projects that are so outlandishly outside of your budget, outside of what anyone would reasonably trust you with, and the only projects you come up with cost, you know, a bajillion dollars. It's like me creating a dystopian sci-fi epic TV show as a star vehicle for myself, despite never having starred in a TV show or really written anything. This was like pre-podcast days, guys. <laughs> well, Jerry suffered with this too. He pitched four-act story ballets, which were expensive and routinely turned down. Eventually, someone suggested he create something smaller, like a one-act with a couple of dancers. And that was the beginning of Fancy Free. He wrote a scenario. Three sailors on leave meet some girls in a bar and dance to impress them. It's a simple story. He went out to find a composer. Robbins asks some composer friends of his if they'll work on his ballet. Both Morton Gould and Vincent Pacetti say, Nah, I I'm busy but both give Bernstein's name, because jazz, basically. It turned out to be remarkably difficult to track down Bernstein. He wasn't particularly well known. Eventually, Oliver Smith, who would go on to work as the set designer for Fancy Free, found Leonard. He worked as a rehearsal pianist. So in a studio at Carnegie Hall, Jerome and Lenny met for the first time. Bernstein played a little music that had just come to him earlier in the day at the Russian Tea Rooms, and it worked. Jerry loved it. It was perfect. And then they sat and talked 
for ages about everything they wanted in the ballet. They got to work, but this was complicated somewhat by the fact that they were all out of town a lot. The ballet theatre toured, Oliver Smith went to work on projects in other cities, and Leonard started moving up in the world. I'm going to get to that more in his very own episode, which is next week. But he was having successes, and that took him out of New York. Someone being out of town didn't stop the team. Leonard Bernstein would work with composer Aaron Copland, who did the music for Agnes de Mille's Rodeo, and basically they would create orchestrations and play them over the phone to Jerome, who would wire back his responses. My editor and I just use like email and Facebook Messenger, but Bernstein and Robbins insisted in living in the before times. The score they created is a mixture of orchestral music and jazz drawing from a lot of the popular music styles of the time. The ballet follows a pretty simple story. Three sailors walk into a bar. Ouch. No, the three sailors are on shore leave. They go to a bar to meet some girls. Three sailors, two girls. The obvious answer is to perform a series of solos designed to impress the girls. Each takes their turn drawing their inspiration both from the original dancer who created the role and from a variety of non-ballet dance styles. Sailor One, originally danced by Harold Lang, is extremely acrobatic. Jumps, turns, the works. He gets up on the bar, splits on the ground. The sort of stuff that makes you go, ow, uh, when you think about attempting it. Sailor 2, originally danced by John Kreiser, is a little more chill, moving more slowly and drawing steps from hoofing, a style of tap. Sailor 3 is Robbins himself. Both the camp tenements dances I mentioned earlier come into play here. A sailor dancing a danzen, which is similar to a rumba. Fancy Free was an instant hit. It was performed 160 times in its first season. The team were all of 25, and they had made it. After Fancy Free, it was suggested that they expand it into a full-length piece. A musical. Could this small ballet become a major Broadway musical? In short, yes. In long, next week. Can't give Robbins all of the credit for their collaborative work. But the TLDR, or TLD... I... I-T-E, too long didn't include in this episode, is that On the Town opened in December of 1944. Yes, Fancy Free opened in April of the same year. No, that is not a normal timeline for a Broadway musical. Well, we're already most of the way through the episode, and we still need to cover 1945 to 1956, which is a long time. I wanted to cover mostly the creation of Jerome Robbins and the beginning of his partnership with Leonard Bernstein. So I'm going to travel pretty quickly through this next section. Don't worry, I'm still going to talk about George Balanchine. I haven't forgotten. And the New York City Ballet and a brief preview of some controversy around Jerome Robbins. In 1949, Robbins joined the New York City Ballet, by which time he had choreographed the ballet Interplay and the musicals Billion Dollar Baby, High Button Shoes, which he won a Tony Award for, and Look Ma, I'm Dancing, which he also directed. The New York City Ballet was the creation of George Balanchine. Balanchine is a big deal in ballet. He is one of only three dance practitioners to have a major ballet technique in their name, the others being Enrico Cicchetti and Agrippa Vaganova, of the Cicchetti and Vaganova techniques, respectively. His technique has a tight across in fourth and fifth positions, a straight leg in a pirouette prep, and is generally known as a more extreme technique. Balanchine dancers on average have shorter careers than those who studied other techniques. But his works are some of the most commonly performed, especially his abstract ballets. I personally am a massive fan of Rubies from Jules, a role that I'd want to do if I had better ballet technique or some ballet technique, and Serenade, 
which is gorgeous and I'm going to talk more about. He was the founder of the New York City Ballet and choreographed a lot of ballets. Like, a lot, a lot. Like Robbins, he was of Russian extraction, except first generation. He was invited to come to the US to start a ballet company, to which he responded, yes, but a a school first. His first ballet was created on these students, Serenade, which is chef's kiss. It's really pretty. From the school, he formed the company. Balanchine had a lot of muses, who he also tended to marry, and then his ex-wife stuck around in the company and still really admired him. It's a really, really bizarre relationship dynamic there. Skinny, long-limbed women inspired Balanchine, and in return, Balanchine reinforced pretty strongly the idea of ballet as a profession for skinny, long-limbed women. He himself said, ballet is woman. Put 16 girls on stage and it's everybody, the world. Put 16 boys on boys and it's always nobody. He also choreographed a little for Broadway, notably 1936's On Your Toes, which featured the ballet Slaughter on 10th Avenue. I talked a little bit about that last season. His version of The Nutcracker also has The Fights, staged by Jerome Robbins. During all of this, there was, you know, like, a war happening. And I did promise last week that I would tell you how Jerome Robbins avoided conscription as, you know, a young, able-bodied man. He did have a medical exam to see if he would be fit for service. And it was one question that disqualified him. When asked if he'd ever had homosexual sex, he responded, yes, last night. I haven't covered all of the various relationships and affairs that Jerome Robbins had because A, I can't keep them all straight in my head, because he had multiple called off engagements with women and romantic affairs of various lengths with men, including a lot of his collaborators. According to his own claims, all the men in Fancy Free. And B, that this isn't the world's most outdated gossip column. We're talking about art here, people. But I thought that that was a pretty funny response to the question, and probably true, and that's that's why we have all these great war-era ballets and musicals. His first ballet at the New York City Ballet was The Guests. It was here that Robin's more abusive side was allowed to flourish. Barbara Birch's book, The Cage, Dancing for Balanchine and Robbins, could be alternatively titled, Jerome Robbins was cruel to me when I was a teenager, to the extent that I left ballet after five years and didn't speak of it for the rest of my life. It was not until her children were adults that they even began to find out she was a dancer. That book is pretty heartbreaking to read. It's also not the only report of Robbins treating people like that. Robert Barnett, in a recent interview with Megan Fairchild, talked about working with Robbins on age of anxiety, which had a Bernstein score. He said that when they were in Covent Garden in London, working on an opera stage, so no sprung floor and no nice Marley, it was hard and a little splintery, Robbins decided he didn't like Robert's exit. So they decided to try some different things, throwing him on the floor and having him roll and into the arms of other dancers. And eventually, when none of these worked... Jerome yelled at Robert, saying that this was all his fault, the setting out to ruin the ballet. Barnett describes himself at the time as 140 pounds soaking wet, which is about 63 kilos. If, you know, you like a measurement system that makes sense. He was very skinny. So this is a man who's all skin and bones being thrown around on a floor that is splintered and hard, and then being yelled at because Robbins didn't come up with anything he liked. Barnett actually stood up to Robbins and, after that, had fewer problems, but there is a pattern. I didn't realise when I decided to research West Side Story that I was going to discover this stuff about Jerome Robbins. I really didn't. And so it does ask this question about art and artists. Because I love Robbins ballets. And I love his work in musical theatre. It's incredible. And I think he was kind of the worst. And I don't have any nice answers. 
So I'm just going to continue on to the next section. Being at New York City Ballet didn't stop Robbins from working on Broadway. In the years between joining Balanchine's Ballet Company and the beginning of West Side Story, Jerry worked on the following shows. <clears throat> As a choreographer, Miss Liberty, Call Me Madam, Rogers and Hammerstein's The King and I, and Two's Company. As a director on The Pajama Game, and as a director choreographer on Peter Pan and Bells Are Ringing. He also continued to create ballets. In 1956, he created one of my all-time favourite ballets, The Concert, which is really funny. Over this time, he also worked as an uncredited show doctor, helping to fix shows which were seen to have some issues before they moved to Broadway. As a show doctor, he worked on A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, 1951, Wish You Were Here, 1952, Wonderful Town, 1953, Silk Stockings, Anchors Away, and Seventh Heaven, all in 1955. And it was from all of this quite impressive background that Jerome Robbins began to work on West Side Story. Next week, you will meet Robbins' longtime collaborator, Leonard Bernstein. Bernstein was a multi, multi talented composer working in all of the genres. You'll also hear the story of On the Town, how it was created and brought to Broadway in less than nine months. Bye for now, but I've got to say, something's coming and it's going to be great.